Howdy, and welcome to Bamberger Ranch. My name is Roel Lopez. I'm the director of the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute, and we're going to continue our Leopold Live series here at Bamberger, continuing to talk about the five basic tools introduced by Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management. These five tools include cow, axe, plow, uh, fire, and gun. And what we hope to do in the upcoming months is show you how those tools can be applied, but with very specific projects and objectives. And so with me is Dr. April Sampson. She's the executive director of Bamberger, and she's going to tell us a little bit about Bamberger and what we hope to cover in the series. Great. Thank you so much, Roel. We're really excited to have you and your colleagues from the Natural Resources Institute back here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve. And we're excited about continuing our journey into Leopold Live version two. Like Roel said, we'll be uh, providing more detail and more useful information regarding the five tools that Aldo Leopold championed. Here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is landowner stewardship, outreach, and environmental education. So we have uh, many Central Texas school children that come visit us every year uh, for hands-on science-based environmental education lessons, and we also lead uh, showcase tours and workshops for landowners interested in practicing restoration and good land stewardship. Um, so we're very happy to be partnering with Natural Resources Institute um, and we hope that we know that you'll benefit a lot from the information that we are going to be um, talking about during this new version of Leopold Live. So let's go ahead and get started. Great. In today's episode of Leopold Live, we are going to be talking about the use of trail cameras or game cameras. Now this is really important to understand how valuable of a tool is this. As a biologist on 5,500 acres, I can't be everywhere at once. Our coworkers can't be everywhere at once, so there's no way to actually survey the entire property with just our eyes. It would take too long. These wildlife cameras really serve as an extra set of eyes for you. Plus, it provides that nice set it and forget it um, moniker. Now, game cameras or trail cameras come in all shapes and sizes. You have the, the cheap ones that like, we use here on the ranch. And then you have the expensive brands like Reconyx. And they even make them now where you can have cell signal. And when they're triggered, they'll send an image or video right to your phone. So all of this comes down to your application. But these game cameras and use of these game cameras qualify you under that wildlife um, censusing part of your, your wildlife valuation. So the censusing is really important and we'll talk about how to use this for deer in a minute. But really what I wanna start talking about is the components of the camera and the placement of the camera. All of these cameras, whether they're Reconyx, Bushnell or one of the other companies is gonna have three main parts. You are going to have your infrared light, you're going to have the actual camera itself, and then you've got the case. And the case is important for your application because not all cases are created equal. If you're out in West Texas and there's not brush cover and there's not oak trees to set this on, that box is going to get really, really hot and that could fry your sensor. So they make specialized boxes just for that. You can also run a cable through this one and lock it to a tree on top of attaching it with a strap. And you can also lock the side with a simple padlock to protect your SD card. All cameras, uh, no matter what brand they are, are gonna have some kind of memory card that they require. And of course, they need to be powered. Batteries, um, we like to use the larger batteries attached to a solar panel but that is an extra part of maintenance and not every camera has that. This camera doesn't have the ability to use an external power. So it's a lot of double A batteries for that. And these cameras require routine checking. You wanna make sure that they're on. The eight double A batteries that power this thing, this camera claims to have a shelf life or a battery life of one year. Now that is one year with a extremely low sensitivity. Each camera is equipped with a different range of sensitivity. You can trigger them by heat, the infrared, or you can trigger them with motion. And you can even trigger them on a time lapse. 
Uh, Texas A&M University uh, just got done with a pine snake study in East Texas, where they had a camera pointed down at a funnel trap, picturing everything that was coming through there, but they were taking a picture every single minute. So that brings me back to the SD card. So you have to know how big your SD card is, you have to know what size file, or picture, or video you're taking, and you have to know what your sensitivity trigger is. You're going to get overwhelmed with pictures and data. So you're going to have to be able to pick out what pictures are useful for you. And when you think about this as a census tool for your wildlife valuation, we often get asked, do I need to submit every single picture? No. Okay, remember with your wildlife valuation, you are managing for target species for human recreation. So if that's deer hunting, you just have to submit pictures of deer. Now all of those pictures or video will have time and date stamps on there. Some of them even come with um, the temperature built on it, which can be really useful when you're out scouting. So we'll talk in a minute here about placement for population census of your deer herd for those hunters. But if you're just after general wildlife, a great thing to do with these are setting it up on a bird feeder or a bird bath. If you're really into game birds, again, that just allows you to set them up in an area you're just not always there for. So you never know when a um, spotted towhee might be coming through because my coworker Christina would say, spotted towhee or eastern towhee? And I would say, well, here's a picture, you tell me. Right? So that's really important when you think about your censusing, especially for birds. But it is also useful to put one of these up on a wildlife um, water station. So if you're going to put water stations around the ranch, monitor it with this. That counts as your censusing. Not only are you seeing that wildlife is coming to the water source, but you know what it actually is coming to this. One of the reasons, or one of the applications we use here on the ranch is to put these in after we find a rare uh, wildlife animal. Uh, ranch manager Stephen Fulton was actually able to track a badger back to a hole and we were able to put this camera on that hole and we were unable to find the, can the badger to come back out though, but we found armadillos, there were rabbits, that, that one little hole at the base of a tree had a lot of wildlife. And we also use these in studying alligator lizards. Because they have infrared, when we find an alligator lizard where it has kind of set up shop for the night, we can set a camera up to tell us when they start moving for the day or for the night. Again, just to get a little bit better idea of their ecology and natural history. And there's multiple ways to set these cameras up. You can use a strap. And there's a lot of different ways uh, to do the straps. Some of them have tensions, some of them like this click together, but you can see here, I'm limited by how far that can go. So you can use bailing wire or you can use uh, zip ties if the application is right. But a, the, rat, the strap I really like are these tensions because they're really, really long. They go into your camera very quickly. Good thing I'm not being timed. I don't know if that was very quickly. And then I can come up to the tree and I can start thinking about where I want to place this camera. So if I'm surveying for animals like deer, I want to place it somewhere between a meter and a meter and a half, three to four foot off the ground. Obviously, I have to get higher than the brush that's underneath this tree. So if I were to place it, I would place it here and then I would point it towards my bait station or my feeder, where, wherever I would be looking, with a clear path. And that's where this sensitivity comes into play. If you have an extremely high sensitivity, any time a leaf moves or a blade of grass moves, it's gonna snap a picture. Okay, so that's where you can get really overwhelmed with data. So you also wanna make sure that it points at that bait station at an appropriate angle. If you're going to census your deer population using cameras, you have to be able to pick out the different deer. Not the different doe, but the different bucks. So if we we're doing a deer population survey, we would set out one camera per 100 acres. Now we can extend that because we're 5,500 acres, but that one to 100 is for 1,000 acres or less. So for a couple hundred dollars, you can survey large swaths of your ranch and get a uh, estimate of what your deer population is. 
So you're going to look through your camera photos and you're going to find what we call the known bucks or identifiable bucks. And let's say you found um, 30 bucks on your camera and you were able to pick out 10. So that you're going to divide that in and your ratio is going to be 0.3. So that number, your known bucks number, is then going to be multiplied by your doe and your fawn. So if you had a hundred doe that you found on your camera, that's going to be 30 as your population. And if you had 10 fawns, that's going to be three. So you're going to add all of those up and your population for that 100 acres is going to be 43, which is really useful if you're running for the managed land deer permit, or you just kind of really want to know what your sex ratio is of your herd and what your fawn survival is too. So by having multiple stations set up over bait, that's the key with those censuses. It has to be over bait, right? And your cameras also have to be out between 10 and 14 days. If you have less cameras, 10 days is great. That'll cover about 80% of your herd. And if you can go 14 days, you're gonna have about 90 to 95% coverage of your herd. So you can get some really good data uh, just by running these cameras. But if you're not after the deer census and you're after wildlife, you're gonna to wanna to find a game trail or you're gonna to wanna to find a watering hole, okay? So you're gonna be looking for tracks, you're gonna be looking for um, different types of scat, and that's where you're gonna to wanna to set up your cameras. And when you're setting that up, an application like a strap might not be the best thing for you. What I really love for surveying lizards or for surveying other wildlife are these flexible tripods that you can get at your local camera store or you can get online and they kind of wrap around whatever you have around. So if you have a T-post that just happens to be out there or a fence line, you can adjust these and this one happens to have a ball head on it, so you can point that as, as need be to where you want to point it. Here at the ranch, not only do we use the game cameras for our deer um, population, we also use it for quail. And we set up nesting surveys, and we have nesting routes too that we set up these game cameras to see what predators are coming. We'll set up dummy nests using chicken eggs to see what's, why our quail populations in certain pastures um, aren't as big as we would like. And so we'll run these with those cameras. And that's very useful because that also kind of gets a hold of your predator composition as well. So game cameras not only are being used by hunters, but they're also being used a lot extensively in research and wildlife managers as well. So where do you think the best place on your property is to set up a game camera? An important side note to when you're setting your camera up is you want to make sure that that camera lens is actually pointing to where you want it to go. If I were to just attach this to the tree, I need to check that that lens is picking up where I want it to go. 90% of the time when you're using a product um, with a strap, you're going to have to use something very technological like a stick to prop it to actually get it to go. Sticks and rocks work wonders, so keep that in mind. And it's another um, good thing to, to carry an SD card reader that hits up to your phone so that you can check placement right away and make sure you're getting the shot that you want. So here we are on the other side. Now you're getting the camera view that we would have. And this area here is where I would set up that bait station for the deer. Behind me, there's a nice thick vegetation where the deer not only will come out of there, but it provides a nice backdrop to be able to pick out individual deer. Now, one of the things you're going to find um, if you're not in Central Texas, where you, you don't have a lot of trees like we do, and then also there's never a tree where you need it to be, okay? We had the ability to pick this site and we picked it on purpose. There's a lot of different ways to set those cameras up. You can um, mount a post in a five gallon bucket full of concrete, then it's a portable camera station. You can put a T-post in the ground and, and put it on that. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. It doesn't always have to involve trees and tripods. Jared, just a few quick questions for you. The first one I'm wondering is just what time of year should I put out my camera? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So when you think about timing of setting your cameras and camera placement, it all comes down to what you're actually trying to survey. Um, for us in a deer population, if we're trying to get it a, a kind of population estimate now and sex ratios, right before hunting season, um, mid-August through mid-September, so you can get your reports done uh, by the end of September, 
And, with, and the rut is gonna change the movements of the deer too. So if you're more interested in trophy bucks and not population dynamics, you're gonna wanna set your cameras up along game trails later in the season during the rut. But if you're after things like ground nesting birds, nesting season is gonna be really important for that. And if you're after things like just monitoring holes or water sources year round. And then just one more question, kind of a general rule of thumb on how often should I be checking my camera? So the, the, the amount of time spending checking your cameras really comes down to what your sensitivity is and what your goals are for censusing. If you have a high sensitivity and a small SD card, obviously you need to check it more often. But that, two, that 10 to 14 day window is a really good application because that'll help you check your batteries, that'll help you know that your memory card is working, and that your camera placement is correct too. There is nothing worse than missing out on some of the deer because you're only getting their, their, their hindquarters in the picture because you were off just a little bit. And, and by checking your game cameras often, you can avoid mistakes like that. All right, well, that was pretty exciting. Sure Thank you for, for joining our session of Leopold Live. Uh, again, uh, we'd like to thank all those uh, speakers and those that participated with our session. Uh, look for upcoming sessions over the course of the next year. And our, per our hope is to cover these very specific topics that are of interest to landowners and natural resource managers. That's right. And I'd like to thank once again the Natural Resources Institute for coming out here and helping us provide this valuable information. Um, at Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we hope to have our programming, including our workshops and tours, uh, back up and running by the fall, depending on how things go. Uh, so make sure to wa watch for both the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute and Bamberger Ranch Preserve on your social media channels. And make sure to uh, check in every once in a while and see what we're up to.